Thank you, Dermot, and welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, when I was asked to do this talk, it was meant to be one talk, uh, but uh, the more I spoke to John and Dermot uh, about uh, all the different aspects of watchmaking, there is a conflict between what I wanted to talk about, uh, the making of watches, and uh, what they were very interested in, how watches worked. So we ended up deciding to make two talks out of it. And in truth, it's such a broad subject that you you, you could go on and on and on. Uh, there are volumes of books written about single aspects of watchmaking. It's a 500 year history, so it's extremely vast. And I'll do my best to get through as much of it as possible over two talks. So, um, so here we go. <laughs> Um, I'm classed as an independent watchmaker. I do make watches, and uh, I'm an independent watchmaker as distinct uh, from the established brands who would have departments where each part of the watch, you'd have specialists uh, in each department specializing on a specific area of the watch. Uh, I endeavor to do everything. And now I do use some outside suppliers and work with some people in areas where I it wouldn't necessarily be my strength, like for instance, in case making. Uh, but uh, as much as possible, I uh, design and make as much of the watches as possible. And I do use some outside components. And uh, But um, the important thing I think is that uh, uh, I employ a lot of the processes that are used to make every single part of the watch. And I think that probably is the best definition of an independent watchmaker. Uh, um, I was trained in the uh, Irish Swiss Institute of Horology, uh, which unfortunately closed in 2004. It is a great loss. I'll talk about it more later, but it uh, was a fabulous foundation uh, to, to go out into the world of watchmaking. Uh, the the teachers there were extraordinary guys, and uh, they really taught us uh, extremely well, they gave us really good skills over the three-year uh, course, but also they gave us uh, an appreciation of quality and uh, a pride in working well. And I think everybody who emerged from that college is very proud of where they came from, and, and they've tried to live up to uh, the standards that are set in the college. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I suppose watchmaking became almost like an obsession for me because when I wasn't uh, working or in college, I was uh, buying books, looking for tools. And I think it's uh, the case for very many watchmakers that uh, you really get drawn into it. And uh, the desire to learn as much as possible brought me to Switzerland. And I lived there for seven years. Uh, I was very lucky to uh, start with uh, Audemars Piguet in the Valley de Joux. And I should be clicking through images here at this point. Um, uh, this is Audemars Piguet. They're considered to be one of the top three grand houses in watchmaking. The other two being Patek Philippe and Vachon Constantin. There are a lot of other brands now, but they, these three brands have long histories making the very highest level of watch. And uh, they all three do to this day. Uh, the Valley de Joux is, uh, it's just postcard pretty. It's a, at a, uh, the base of the valley is about the height of Karen Tuchel. Uh, and uh, it, it, watchmaking traditionally started there. Uh, oh, I don't have dates, but about 200 years ago, uh, when farmers who couldn't farm in the winter, they started watchmaking in, yeah, off season. And uh, in the spring, they come down with their wares. <laughs> uh, the valley was literally cut off in the winter. Uh, you have uh, uh, 1,400 meter passes to get out of the valley from any direction. Um, so, you see farmhouses with telltale 
uh, windows in the north facing gable end. If you see that, you know that there was a watch, a watch workshop of some description up there. Um, the idea of them being north facing, if there are any watch, I know there are some watchmakers in the room. One of the worst things is having uh, direct sunlight going across your bench. Uh, it's you can't work like that. So having north facing diffused light is ideal. And the up in the attic, you're getting the best light uh, in in the house. So uh, now, normally, when you're looking across a uh, industrial zone, it's not very pretty. But we literally are looking across an industrial zone in this photograph. Uh, you've got companies like Audemar Piguet, Gilles Lecoult. Uh, they're the, the big companies that are from there, based there. But also you have houses like uh, Vachon Constantin, Patrick Philippe, the Geneva-based houses. They also have workshops up there, tapping into the, the skills that, uh, that exist there. Um, I was drawn to Audemar Piguet. They're very famous for their Royal Oak wristwatch. I was drawn there because of their complications. Uh, they made more than anybody at the time when I was leaving college. And I thought I was interested in working on perpetual calendars, on tourbillons, on miniature peters. And I fancied that my best chance of working on those type of mechanisms was working in a company that made a lot of them, rather than a company that made a very few that watchmakers would be striving to get into that workshop. I made a good choice because uh, I did eventually get to, to work on those, those watches. At the time as well, Audemars Piguet were in the Guinness Book of Records for selling the most expensive watch in the world, which is the Grand Complication pocket watch. One a year was made. Uh, there were simpler times. Watches have gotten a lot more expensive and the number of watches that far exceed that in price is... It's actually difficult to get my head around, but uh, uh, it was a, a, a good move at the time. Um, after five years, uh, I was ex I got the itch to really get into the development of watches. So I left Audemars Peak and I found a company in Le Locle, which is uh, also in the French-speaking Jura Mountains. And... Uh, Christophe Clary, they specialized in developing movements for the bigger houses. At the time, he didn't have, uh, he didn't sell watches under his own brand. He does now. But um, immediately, I was working on miniature repeaters, tourbillons, grand complication wristwatches, and the development of those watches. It was an extraordinary experience. Uh, I spent two years there, and I think uh, it was uh, exhausting, but I, I, I felt filled so much experience since that time. And in 1999, I decided to move back to Ireland. Uh, I was, at the time, there was so much work uh, for these companies. Uh, they, I was pushing an open door when I negotiated to get that work back here in Ireland. So ever since I returned to Ireland, I continued to make those watches, miniature repeaters, tourbillons, Westminster chime and miniature repeaters. So it was just a very, very fortunate timing. Um, two of my brothers, uh, Stephen and Anthony, they are also watchmakers. They also attended the Irish Institute of Horology. And in myself and Stephen, we, uh, we developed our own brand, McGonagall Watches. I've sent, oh, hang on, I, sorry, this is Christoph Clare uh, in the lock, the, the Christoph Clarag company. And this is uh, our first model, uh, McGonagall Watches. I've since left McGonagall Watches and it's now uh, run by Stephen. And he's making some extraordinary watches. He currently makes a miniature repeater uh, that is absolutely wonderful. It's one of the finest, I think, on the market. Uh, he has his, another brand as well, uh, which I've missed the slide. Yeah. There's another brand, the Gone Watches. Uh, it's a more accessible price, but it's a, another wonderful uh, brand that he has developed. Um, I developed my own brand, Ilon Watches. And uh, this is the model I currently make. It's the HB1. It's a 
I, I'll talk about it later on uh, towards the end after I show some of the techniques I use to make the watch. Okay. So with this talk, I wanted to talk about uh, how watches uh, were originally developed and some of the techniques they used to, uh, to make them, how the transformed into precision instruments, how eventually they were industrialized and how uh, modern techniques, modern technology and modern materials have since been applied to, uh, to how they're made currently. Uh, so with the introduction of watchmaking, uh, the first watches appeared about uh, in the 16th century and you wouldn't really recognize them as watches that look like small table clocks, but they were watches in the sense that they were portable and they were made possible by the invention of the mainspring. And they were barrel shaped. Uh, and you can see an example there. Uh, the movements were originally made out of iron. So they used the top specialists in uh, iron work of, at the time, uh, blacksmiths and locksmiths. Um, and they were extremely crude, not surprisingly, because they didn't have technology to make anything finer than that. These were the very pinnacle of, uh, of their technology at the time. Uh, the components were all hand cut, uh, even the, the gears and the in the wheels. So you can imagine uh, transmission of power was very, very variable. Springs, they would have uh, um, a short range. They would have a lot of power at the very beginning and very, very little towards the end. And I think timekeeping was more notional almost than practical. But uh, they, were, um, they were sought after by uh, wealthy people. They were symbols of prestige. And uh, uh, they advanced in the uh, 17th century to more ornate watches. Uh, you can see the introduction of brass uh, over iron. Uh, they understood, start to understand that uh, you'd have much greater wear qualities if you had uh, gears made out of brass, meshing with pinions made out of steel. And uh, they also started to develop more sophisticated equipment to, to make the watches. So they would use more indexing uh, tools to get more even cuts on the wheels. They would use jigs uh, that would, uh, so with a jig you're holding a very, very small component and you're using a large tool to work on a very small component. And uh, so the, the jig will guide uh, your, your your, the tool that you're using, and it will give a more uh, precise and better finish, all of which contributes to lower friction. And uh, the result is better power, power transmission, better timekeeping, longer running. Uh, then with the, in the 18th century, watches became more precision pieces, precision instruments. Obviously you still had uh, the watches that were ornate and made for very, very wealthy people. Uh, but um, there was a, a great need to solve what was probably the, the technical challenge of the day. And it was the calculation of longitude in navigation. Uh, latitude in navigation is relatively easy to uh, to calculate, you you measure the height of the of the sun at midday, and you can relate it to a set of tables for the time of year, and you can tell where about on what latitude you are on on the planet. But longitude is a lot more complicated because it the sun, which is the basis by which you measure your position, is traveling across the the sky. Uh, and it is uh, it, it was a puzzler. The only way they could actually determine their position was through dead reckoning. 
and that was always very approximate and uh, it could be thrown, your, your calculations could be thrown out very, very easily. And once they were, you could not reestablish your position. So uh, the solution was thought uh, to have been worked out by astronomers that they would find some way of relating celestial observations to where you are and calculating your position. Incredibly complicated solutions were, were, were devised. Some of them worked, but they weren't really applicable for, from standing on the deck of a moving ship. Um, the solution ended up coming from uh, the invention of a clock with such precision that you could work out your current position at midday and relate it to the clock that you have on board that is giving the time of your home port. And by calculating the difference between the two, you can eventually, through very complicated calculations, uh, work out your position, but it could be done. And uh, this was a game changer. It was uh, any country that could uh, work out how to calculate longitude precisely could, they could rule the waves. It would, they'd gain commercially, they'd gain militarily, they'd expand their empire. And so various countries offered uh, a huge, you know, substantial prizes to, uh, for anyone who could solve this. And the man who eventually did was a carpenter turned clockmaker from Lincolnshire called John Harrison. Uh, there's a fabulous book, uh, which was eventually turned into a film by Davis Sobel, which I highly recommend. It's called Longitude. And honestly, it reads like a thriller. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. And uh, it's, you don't need to be technical to be excited by this story. I, I, I really recommend it. Um, his watches, uh, you can see the first one was a clock. And, uh, but he, the watch he eventually won his prize with was a watch. Uh, there were technical marvels. The first uh, clock he made, unsurprisingly, for a carpenter, it was made out of wood. Uh, even the gears were made out of wood. Um, but uh, he displayed a great understanding of materials um, by using, he had uh, lignum vitae, which is a, a wood that produces a natural oil. And he used these for bearings to avoid the necessity of using a lubricant for, uh, for his bearings. So, uh, he used diamond uh, for the impulse surfaces, and uh, he also used a system of uh, thermal compensation. Uh, temperature is a problem with timepieces in that uh, with variations in temperature, metals expand and contract, and um, it varies the timekeeping. He used a system uh, where he used measured le lengths of materials with known rates of compensation. And he'd, comp he'd use other material, other metals with different rates, and he'd use them against each other to actually balance out perfectly the, uh, the thermal compensation. Uh, so he, it, it was a, a kind of a groundbreaking moment because for the first time in history, people were placing their trust in an instrument rather than uh, observations in nature. And they were placing their, their lives and their fortunes in this technology. And it was kind of a groundbreaking moment in history, in human history. Uh, where watches started to become accessible to people was when interchangeability was developed. And to do that, you had to produce parts in, produce systems where you could produce parts uh, that were so precise that they could be interchanged. You could take a component out of a drawer and just pop it on the watch and it would work. And uh, Vacher and Constantin were uh, one of the first companies to develop tools to do this. One of the, uh, first tools to help with it in this endeavor was the pantograph machine. And you can see here, 
engraving machines nowadays use this principle where you would have a template that the, uh, if I can just follow the arrow here, you're using, uh, say the template here to follow uh, a large pattern and it's engraving on a, at a smaller scale. That the scale can be set by the length of these levers and how they work together. Um, now, rather than a quill or a, a graver um, marking a surface, that quill could be interchanged with a machine head. And uh, I was trying to find a machine where you could really see what was going on. And here's one from a car workshop. It's not a watch workshop, <laughs> but you can see here the pattern or the template is here and the machine head is there. So you would follow, you would trace around the, uh, the profile of the part, which is here. And the, the spinning machine head would machine the component at a much smaller scale uh, on, the, on the table there. And uh, that was one of the machines that helped to uh, industrialize uh, um, watch small watch components. Also, uh, Jeje Lecoult came up with extremely fine uh, measuring instruments as well, and also to to check the precision of uh, the components once they were made was of the utmost importance as well. And uh, with the development of these tools, that made that possible. Uh, then in the, uh, hang on, I'll just pause this for a sec. Um, in the, towards the middle of the uh, 19th century in America, they started to industrialize. They created the first production line uh, to produce watches. And Henry Ford, who had watchmaker training, uh, followed the principles that they used in the production line of watches to uh, create, develop the production line in the Ford Motor Company. Um, so with the development of steam powered uh, tools, the aforementioned tools such as the pantograph machine, stamping tools, all sorts of equipment like that, uh, watches can be made in vast quantities. And by the end of the 19th century, compared to the beginning of the 19th century, the average price of a watch had dropped by up to 95% it's calculated. Uh, so it may it now was accessible to, to nearly everyone. And it that of course had uh, important impact socially because people could set a time to go to a precise time to go to work and uh, everything that follows with precise timekeeping. Um, here we can see uh, one of the one of the very interesting tools for making turned components. It's an automatic lathe, and uh, uh, I've these have been superseded by CNC controlled or computer controlled lathes. Um, but I find these really fascinating. When I first arrived in Switzerland, these were in common use in companies such as the Swatch Group. So you'd have vast rooms with uh, hundreds of these lathes just making tiny screws and pinions and, uh, and shafts. And uh, a watch, I've, I knew there was a watchmaker in Denmark, uh, Christian Lass, he makes these fabulous uh, handmade watches. And uh, he has uh, taken some of these machines that have been taken out of commission and he has restored them and he uses them in the production of his own watches. So you can see that, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, the, the cams, are actually guiding the, the cutters as they, as the stock protrudes, it's fed through the collet. And uh, so as the piece of metal, the bar of metal uh, advances, it uh, is, you can see their profile of the cam and that's the command cam. And there you can see, Um, the, 
they are screws. So it's a, like a little train of screws that have just been uh, turned uh, and uh, he'll part them off. He'll finish them on another machine. But um, so I just thought that was, uh, it's a, a fascinating thing to see in motion. Uh, but uh, it also helped in the industrialization of, of, uh, of watches. Okay, if I just proceed. So in the 20th century, uh, we continued very much in the same vein uh, until the introduction of CAD. And I think that has been a, a massive leap forward in how watches are designed and made. And you can see here uh, a 3D drawing of, of the case of my watch. And uh, so it, everything is calculated to an infinitesimal level. Uh, this file can be checked. You can see that something is working. Uh, you can then use that file, send it to a CNC machine or whatever machine is going to make it. And uh, it's made within a very, very tight tolerance. And uh, you can also check the aesthetics of a watch. Uh, you can get uh, very accurate renderings uh, to see what your watch is going to look like. What we had to do when when I first arrived in Switzerland was uh, you're working off hand drawings of watches, the aesthetic drawings, you would get technical drawings, you would make it, you'd look at it and kind of go, okay, we need to change a lot of things here. And, uh, and now an awful lot of that guesswork can be taken out by uh, rotating uh, the watch, by uh, what, looking at it from different angles. You can get the cases 3D printed, you can just check the volumes, you can see how it is on the wrist and everything like that. And it's saving time, it's saving money, and it's allowing us to make uh, much more advanced designs. And uh, so you can just, uh, I'll just flick through a couple of these here. Now I didn't do these drawings myself. The man who did is in the room here, uh, Graham Houghton. Uh, uh, he's, um, and you can see here, we have a, a sapphire dial uh, on the bottom and the raised part of the dial are machined. It's machined brass, which is then coated and finished and printed. So it, it's quite a complex dial and made all more easy by uh, CAD process. Here you can see the seconds hand uh, on, um, this is for again, the HB1. The chronograph, and the reason I'm showing this is because uh, apart from being a nice looking hand, it's also uh, calculated to have the center of gravity as close to the center as possible. So very important on the center seconds hand because you can get uh, an awful wobble on a hand um, if, if it's not properly balanced. And with a chronograph, you've got a quite a, a violent uh, return to zero. Um, and if if it's not balanced, that can also have repercussions as well. So um, CAD makes this uh, makes the designing of the hand so much easier. And there's uh, an accurate rendering that you could almost mistake it for a photograph of the watch. So again, you can see how this is very very helpful in determining the aesthetics of the watch before you actually make it. Um, here is a, a short video of a, of a watch we worked on together. Uh, uh, it has a... Uh, the original and, inspiration actually, for the Rematois that Derek Pratt incorporated into his Turbion pocket watches the video, um, was taken from the a small audio. clock. Uh, and the, the idea to use his Rematois in a wristwatch came prior to Derek's see, passing. You can check that something is functioning. Functionally, in the Rematois movement. regulates the power by running, from the mainsprings, uh, uh, which is delivered to the escapement the once every second, and what resulting in an extremely consistent power flow and, and uh, thus better timekeeping. You even get views 
From At the center past, of the remontoir be is a rouleau-shaped ruby cam the that is directly light, connected uh, to the escape wheel. Because you can turn it every which way, you can get rid of As the, the cam rotates, your main it is followed by the remontoir can, uh, fork that moves back and forth, exactly what's going releasing on power from every aspect. by the remontoir wheel, so it's, uh, which it's recharges the remontoir tool. spring that is directly coupled with the escape wheel. This process repeats every fifth beat of the balance wheel, exactly. Uh, okay, um, I just want to talk while we're, I mentioned materials earlier on, uh, and uh, you often hear talk about jewels in a watch, and uh, um, jewels are non-precious, they're synthetic. It's synthetic sapphire with an oxide added to give the ruby color. Originally, there were either diamond or ruby in watches about um, in previous centuries. Um, nowadays, for greater accuracy, uh, they're made in a furnace. They create a glass boule, as they call it. They slice it. Uh, they polish it. They cut it in little rondelles, pierce it, either with a laser or originally with a copper wire infused with uh, uh, impregnated with diamond and um, the jewel well the bearing is composed of two parts it's the the jewel material with a hole in it and the pivot on the wheel that's protruding through and you would have another one on the other side of the bridge uh, so you'd have one in the main plate one on the bridge pivots either end so you can appreciate you can really accurately control the amount of play and it is a it's used because it's a hard material it doesn't wear very easily it's got good wear characteristics while working with steel it doesn't wear the steel very badly at all um it also has good oil retention qualities and uh uh and very low friction so it's uh it's a fantastic material and uh uh, it really was a big leap forward in watchmaking as well. Um, other materials that they use in modern watchmaking, I, I don't have examples of them here. It's better that I describe them rather than show them. I suppose in uh, in the making of watches, uh, we use a lot, a lot of, rather than using steel cutters, we use tungsten carbide a lot now. Again, it's extremely hard. It can work on harder materials but it uh, gives really clean cuts. It's very, very high precision. And uh, um, you have industrial diamonds used as well. Uh, I can show you some a little later on. And, uh, uh, but also we use more materials like titanium, either for the cases. Some watchmakers use them for the for components inside the watch. It's, it's light, it's... Uh, it's anti-allergic, and um, uh, it, it, it's a it's a very good material for for watch cases. Uh, synthetic sapphire. It sounds like an exotic material, but uh, most watches sold today would have uh, the crystals would be synthetic sapphire, so they're uh, very scratch resistant, and uh, um, and it's pretty much standard on watches now. Um, we are using uh, silicon in, I'm going to say we, in the watch industry, they're developing a lot of components made out of silicon. Now, these are made by using processes which would be very similar to the uh, uh, fabrication of microchips. So it's uh, using lithography to mask and expose to an ultraviolet light. The material is then washed away, and the resultant material that's left is about as precise as you can imagine. Uh, it's been used now for escapements. It's used for hair springs, and uh, they're also mixing it with other material to produce materials such as silicium. And there are other variants as well uh, that give uh, characteristics that give extremely high precision uh, to uh, the timekeeping. And uh, so it's um, uh, I, I think it's almost indistinguishable, the industry from what has been made in the past. 
And uh, you might be wondering how independent watchmakers fit into all of that. And I, I'll try and show it now in a sec. Um, while I still have it on the screen, I have, uh, you can see there's a jewel assembly. So you have a flat jewel there without a hole in it. You have a small jewel in a setting with a hole. And you have this brass setting and a spring on top. That all, it's an exploded drawing. It all fits together and it is a shock uh, absorbing assembly. So when you see shockproof on a watch, you don't see it anymore because all, watch may, all watches have these systems. But this allows you to drop your watch and uh, for the delicate balance staff that is the most, perhaps the finest component in the watch, it prevents it from, from breaking. And so it's uh, that uh, assembly, uh, I'd say the smallest jewel there is about the size of a full stop. It's they're tiny, and uh, it's so you can really appreciate just the amount of precision that goes in to make these. Uh, right, so this is my workshop, and uh, you won't find any uh, silicon or silicium or <laughs> uh, any exotic materials such as that there, although I do use titanium. Um, but uh, in this room, I have most of the machines I need to make a watch. Uh, I have uh, in the corner here a jig bore machine. It's like a, a vertical milli machine, so I can work on the X and Y axis, and I can rotate uh, the table. And of course, I have a Z axis as well, where I can put either a scope to center uh, the piece I'm working on. And uh, once I have it all set up, I can replace it with the machine head, uh, so I can drill or mill or whatever. Uh, it's a uh, very, very useful tool. I have various lathes uh, from the large two lathes in the corner to the very small watchmaker lathes. And any engineers would be fascinated with these because they're really very small. Some of them are even driven by a bow or uh, a cable that you hand drive and you can cut uh, the piece you're working on. With the other, it takes quite a bit of coordination to be able to do that. Uh, you can see just various other views of our workshop. This is my uh, work, my my own bench, and uh, it's got the microscope beside as well because we don't commonly use it. Uh, it's more for checking stuff rather than working all day under it. Uh, we use the eyeglass. Um, and there's uh, my lathe with, uh, uh, here we have an indexing uh, fitting. And by using that, there's a worm gear here on the bottom and you can advance the uh, machine head by very precise degrees. And we use this principally for cutting wheels. Uh, so you would have uh, another, uh, machine head mounted on the cross slide. You would index it with uh, the wheel, cut a tooth, uh, bring it back, advance it to the next wheel and so on. And uh, you can, those, wheel, those discs are interchangeable. So you can have a vast variety of uh, tooth counts uh, based on that. And uh, that's the small watchmaking lathe. And again, another view of the jig bore. Uh, just some laid work. And here you can mount, uh, we would, uh, you can hold delicate components by gluing them onto a, a face plate. And in the past, they would use shellac. And uh, uh, you can work on, you know, you can spin the, the, the bridge and work on uh, putting a final finish on a bearing or opening out a hole to take a jewel uh, or doing a milling. And here I'm uh, machining a, a, a winding stem. So I'm cutting the square of the winding stem. Uh, I'm cutting the next diameters and there it's close to finishing. And on this lathe I'm doing the threading. So I have, uh, these are tungsten carbide discs rather than 
the old fashioned dies. So I can actually turn something in hard metal and with the uh, tungsten carbide discs, uh, do my thread. They're discs, so they roll, they don't tear the material. You get a very, very fine thread, and all I have to do after that is polish it. It's uh, uh, just good use of the modern materials that we have at our disposal. Uh, other things we can do in the lathe, we can get complex shapes and uh, say work on the arms of a tourbillon cage. And it just, once you have the arm, which is tapered and curved, once you have that machined, you, you can go on to the next stage, which is the polishing of the arms and the rest of the cage uh, with great ease. You've got a uniformity uh, by machining this accurately first. And then you can move on to the polish and you can get a, a very, very nice uh, finish uh, by using this process. Um, other machines we have in our uh, workshop, this is an example of a, 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 a tool called a Jaco tool. It's for uh, polishing pivots or burnishing pivots more accurately. So we, with a bow, we would rotate the, the piece. You can see that it's going to pivot between this uh, fitting and there's a bed where the pivot lies and uh, you have different sizes depending on the diameter of the pivot. And uh, with the bow, we will rotate this spool, which with little arms that we engage in the teeth, or rather in the arms of the, of the wheel to rotate it. And I think we have a video here just to show it. So just put a bit of oil on the various surfaces. And <laughs> it's notoriously hard to film these things and keep your hands out of the way as well. Uh, so I'm just fitting everything in place and locking it down. This is slower than I thought it would be. And there's the burnisher. So I just have to, you really have to get your hand in to feel the pivot under your burnisher. And once you have it, you have to be as straight as possible. Otherwise you'll get a very bad shoulder on the pivot. And uh, so I'm rotating it and using quite a bit of pressure on the pivot while rotating it. And uh, uh, in French to this day, the rule de pivot, they roll the pivots. It's not, you don't polish them. Uh, you're, you're compressing the material, thereby hardening it. And, uh, and you're getting the fine polish at the same time. Okay, so uh, you can see the pivot there at the end. It's from a different wheel. And this is the assembly of a wheel. So just popping it together, put the wheel on top and you can see there's a, a, a countersink which we rivet over the wheel to make sure it's uh, solidly seated and it's not going to move. And there is a, a pivot that's has a nicely polished uh, seat. Okay, uh, I mentioned diamond tools earlier on. Uh, this is a diamond graver that's uh, doing a diamond cut on a balance wheel. And uh, it, uh, when your diamond cut is finished, you don't have to do anything else. The, the polish is really, really high. And uh, it's amazing that a cutter can give you that finish straight away. Um, and here we've just various other things. Uh, this is working on a case. And really what I'm trying to show is just the, 
I'm trying to give a representation of the type of uh, yeah. tasks I go through with the various machines. Uh, That's not in your way there, is it? No. And this is um, the jig bore machine. Uh, so I can uh, clamp things onto the table center them very, very precisely, and there I'm using the tungsten carbide uh, mill end to drill into a case. Yeah. Uh, uh, for prototyping components, uh, it's invaluable. You can, uh, uh, it's much slower than making things in production, like, uh, but if you're working on a prototype piece, it's good to see how, uh, how something is going to work uh by making it by hand first and then when you're certain that it works you can do alter the CAD drawing to make sure that uh, uh you've taken all of the modifications into account and then you send it off and you get it made by CNC and uh you you get them made in quantities uh here we have uh a bridge that we're centering over another to make sure that it's utterly uh uh, centered and so you'd mount everything and then drill right through the hole and then you're certain that the uh, the jewel that you set into the bridge is perfectly centered over the main plate uh, and more machining again we can rotate the movement on the side and d drill for the winding stem so you can see just through all of these uh tools like there's a wide variation of what you can do there's a, a, a with the tools and bit by bit you can work out how to make every component in the watch by using the lathe the jig bore and your hands so uh still for prototyping or one-off pieces uh you would uh, uh cut out a piece of steel in the old-fashioned way with a fret saw then you file it to shape and you might machine it on back your back into jig bore again. So you'd machine for um for screw holes, for pin holes. If there's uh, a func a very precise function, you'd use the uh jig bore machine to to hit those parts that are critical. Um steel components, uh once they're made to size, uh we have to go through a hardening process. So uh there's a, a component underneath, underneath that flame. Uh, once it reaches a, a cherry red color, we drop it into oil or water. And uh, then we would uh, we clean it up and blew it to bring it to the correct temper, uh, temper. If we left it fully hardened, it would be too brittle, it would break. And uh, so uh, that's how we achieve the, the right hardness uh, for our components. Uh, we use an awful lot of jigs to hold the fine components so as you can do um, fine uh, finishing, such as beveling or even just cleaning up the, the, the parts. And uh, the it takes a bit of time to make jigs for every single component, but it's well worth it. It's the only way you can uh, work to high quality. And... Uh, so for instance, this is a, a jig I'm making for a restoration piece. So I'm just turning the disc. It's a tourbillon cage for a pocket watch. And then I cut out the bits that are in my way. And now I've clear access to, uh, to work on the curved part of the bridge with, uh, with files and polishers. And you can see it's going through the polishing sage there. And there's the fi finished uh, cage. And there it is assembled. Uh, we also um, do an awful lot of hand polishing. One thing at this level of watchmaking uh, that's criti of critical importance is finishing. It's as important as the function. Uh, these, are, these are expensive watches, so they can't just work well. They have to look beautiful as well. And um, a lot of the skill in making these watches is in high finishing. So this is a, um, a tin block 
with diamond paste on it. I've mounted a part onto a jig and uh, we rotate it on the tin block to until it starts to grind the, uh, the components. And the result is, you can see, I have a mixture of finishes here. I have curved arms, which I've protected, uh, but the top part there is mirror finished and it's literally a mirror. Uh, I mean, you can, uh, I don't have a picture here, but you can see a reflection of your tweezers uh, in, the, in the steel once it's properly polished. And there's the, the finished article with the curved arms, uh, with the varnish taken off. And there it is finished and fitted to the watch and the finished watch. Uh, we do various other finishes, such as uh, here I'm doing a spotting or a perlage, where you use an abrasive to make a swirly circle all the way around. Uh, you don't want to see any surface where there are any uh, machine marks visible. So we do something to every surface. Um, in industrial watches, or more uh, common, more mid-range watches, we would use sandblasting or uh, industrial processes to give an overall finish. But at this level, uh, you want to handwork every uh, uh, surface and uh, a large part of the artistry is in the, the finishing. Here I'm uh, beveling. I'm using a, a piece of wood with some diamond paper, another modern material, uh, to put a, there's a 45 degree angle on the surface of every spring, every lever, uh, in this case, a bridge. And uh, I'll get it to a high state of finish with the, with the diamond paper. You go through different grades until, uh, you, until you get it very highly polished. And then you'd finish with uh, natural materials such as wood impregnated with diamond paste. Uh, and that's a bit of elder, wood, elder pith wood. It sounds quaint, but uh, you won't get a better finish with anything else. It's, uh, it's, uh, if there was a modern material I could use to replace it, I would, but right. it just works so well. Uh, and here is you've circling based on the jig that I have. Uh, I mount the plates and I can circle it very precisely in the lathe. Then it goes through uh, an electroplating process for either gold plating or rhodium plating. And there's the finished bridge and the watch. Uh, um, this is the same piece. It's a, uh, you have the teeth of a wheel. You can see how rough they are. It can be like that after finishing or after machining. We go through each uh, tooth and finish them. That's the same wheel. Uh, and you can see the reflection of the tooth on that face there. It is, it's, it's a mirror finish. And uh, that's reducing your friction. So it, every effort in that to that end is is worth it. Um, that isn't actually decorative; that's functional. And that's the top wheel, and there it is in the watch again. Uh, and that's the rest of the watch. Okay, um, I've just a few more slides on. Here we have hands uh, that I I'd finish them again on a jig I'd make up. The jigs, they're not works of art, uh, but they're not meant to be. They are just to supply a, a function, which is to hold something accurately while you can just worry about uh, finishing it without worrying about breaking it. And there's the set of hands fully polished. And then I heat treat them uh, uh, to get the blue finish. And you can see the center of the minute hand I polish that on a 10 block again. So there's a lot of finishing just in a set of hands, if you're going to do it properly. Um, here we have uh, the balance wheel. Uh, we poise it to get the weight perfectly even. If you don't do that, the timekeeping is um, 
is completely out. So we to, to get as precise a timekeeping as possible, we try and poise that as perfectly as we can, first on this uh, poising tool, and then later on when it's in the watch, you measure the timekeeping and uh, by analyzing the, the, the rates and different positions, you can determine where the rest of the overweight is and remove it at that point. Uh, here we are making a making a, a hairspring based on the overcoil uh, shapes that have been worked out by uh, by great watchmakers a long long time ago, um, and this is a uh, um, a hairspring or vibrating tool. You have a, a master uh, hairspring underneath. This spring you're working on, you're trying to determine the length of the hairspring to match the two frequencies of the top balance and the one below. And here you can see they're actually quite close. You can see that the arms are uh, moving more or less the same together. And uh, for anyone who's done it, it's uh, uh, the first one you do, you'll spend a few days doing it. It's uh, and you'll probably go through a few hairsprings, uh, but the more you do them, like anything, the easier it gets. And there's the finished hairspring. And uh, this is the HB1. Uh, this is the back of it. You can see all of the components are finished and adjusted, and the watch is all together. So you can see there's a high level of finish there. And <coughs> hopefully you'd have seen in the previous slides how I worked towards that. And uh, and there's the front of it. So um, the HB1 is it's a, a chronograph with triple calendar and moon phase. It's based on an existing caliber, uh, a Valju 88, which is a venerable old caliber that was used by a lot of the of the very famous watch houses in Switzerland. I had a, the good fortune to come across a, a stock of unused 88s and what I do is I take them completely, completely down to component form, refinish the components I'm going to continue to use. I design and remake uh, other components, and and it's housed in this titanium case with the sapphire dial. So that's uh, that's pretty much what I do. Um, just to move on, sorry, I, I think I'm running over time here. Uh, but I just want to talk about uh, two things. Uh, first of all, is the concept of an Irish watchmaking industry. Why wouldn't we do that? Um, the idea of a watch, uh, a high-end watch having to come from Switzerland, that day is long past. You've got uh, watches made in England and Holland, Finland, Germany. Uh, they're, they're, they, they don't have to fight this perception of not being Swiss anymore. They're, they're equally regarded as, as the highest of Swiss watches are. And uh, in fact, I think we have uh, broken through the glass ceiling by making some very expensive watches here in Ireland. And we have already market throughout the world. Uh, we don't make them in great numbers. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I think we've addressed the perception that a high-end watch can't be made here in Ireland. We've shown that it can, uh, but uh, we're very small um, and I think more could be done. But the biggest thing standing in our way of actually achieving this is the lack of watchmaker training in Ireland. The day we lost the Irish Institute of Horology was a very bad day for uh, watchmaking in this country. But I think for this, we lost something in this country as well. Um, we lost a great expertise. Uh, there is wonderful pride in what was done there because it was world class. And uh, even though in, in the midst of the 80s, in the middle of the 80s, when I graduated from uh, uh, the Irish Institute of Horology, uh, Anybody who chose to stay in Ireland uh, and work, got work. Uh, that was against a backdrop of almost 20% unemployment in Ireland. And they didn't all get work as watchmakers, but surely that doesn't matter. Because I think a lot of people go to university and they get degrees in any given domain. 
they don't necessarily work in that domain once they leave. I think the metric we should use for the success of any kind of educational institution is how many jobs are, uh, how many people get jobs out of it. And the skills uh, that a watchmaker learns, uh, they're transferable across so many different industries. Um, a lot of the students who graduate from the college, they were snapped up by Intel, by biomedical device industries, by other precision industries. Anything that required prototyping or even managing uh, a line where precision was of paramount importance, use these people. And uh, I think uh, that's one aspect. The other aspect is we could actually have a watchmaking industry. So I think if there is anybody who is in this room or listening online, who can do anything to actually move us to a situation where we reestablish watchmaking in Ireland or watchmaker training in Ireland again, if you could make any effort, it would be all for the good. I think we, we could regain something very valuable that we lost. So with that, I uh, would anyone like to ask any questions? Nope. Um, just welcome to questions from the floor this evening, but uh, we might start with some questions online just to get the juices going, and uh, I'm sure there are people here who have some questions they'd like to ask. So what I would ask is, the people who are in the room, if you want to ask a question, please be mindful that there are attendees online, so I will hand you the microphone, or my colleague John will hand you the microphone, uh, so just wait till you have the microphone in your hand before you ask the question. Any questions online, John? I hear you. Um, just to say, there are a good few questions online. So if you don't get to everyone's question, we will endeavor to answer them and send you a an answer by email. And to start off, I know we've got a couple of uh, technical students in today. One of the questions online is um, Is there a book that you recommend for a beginner watchmaker? Watchmaker looking for historical and technical accounts of, of, the, of the trade? Um. George Daniels, who's no longer with us, he uh, he wrote this book, uh, Watchmaking. And uh, whenever anyone asked, went up and asked him, uh, Mr. Daniels, how do I do this or how do I do that? He'd just say, did you read my book? Because it's in it. And it really is the definitive book on how to make a watch. Uh, but it mightn't be immediately comprehensive. Uh, for someone who hasn't, who isn't a watchmaker, who, who is could be difficult to understand some of uh, the explanations because when you haven't seen a lathe, it can be difficult to imagine how it works by just looking at, by reading text and looking at a drawing. Um, so, but there's a vast amount of information online. Uh, there are YouTube videos. There's a lot of uh, uh, channels that are actually really educating about watchmaking now. But if you're looking for a book, Watchmaking by George Daniels. Thank you. Um, another question I have for you, uh, so it's just like in the construction industry, there are architects and engineers. Um, is that the same in the watchmaking industry, or do people usually do better? Um, no, it's, it, it is the same as in the construction industry of uh, constructors and uh, the watchmaking industry. And uh, many of them would have uh, watch design experience or watchmaking experience. Uh, they uh, increasingly, uh, the, the best courses that are for watchmaking uh, would teach both. And then people would branch out and specialize in one area or another. Uh, but uh, the best construct, there are courses that only do construction. Uh, but from my experience, uh, the best uh, constructors know how to make a watch as well because they can understand uh, what a watchmaker is experiencing, uh, what's difficult to put together uh, and what's more likely to work. It's some things that uh, work on a computer screen don't necessarily work in, in reality. So I think that interchange is very important. Yeah. Hello, uh, you mentioned that uh, you use 
for your model, the value um, watch. How much of that watch is actually, what percentage of it is yours? Oh, uh, in components, um, in the number of components, it's not very high, um, but um, but every single component is really worked. Uh, so uh, there isn't anything put back in the watch without having been polished or reburnished or beveled or reprofiled. Uh, but uh, there isn't a, an awful lot of uh, uh, movement components that are mine. There are a certain number. Uh, obviously, the, the case style hands. Uh, they're all mine. Uh, I suppose a comment I have is for someone starting in the watchmaking business that they play around with clocks is not a bad way to get there. Absolutely. Uh, there are even, uh, you can buy, yeah, you, uh, some people have bought pocket watches as well, uh, either uh, watches that weren't with their cases anymore. Um, but uh, definitely clocks are, uh, it's, a, it's an easy first step. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I, would, I would caution, though, don't take anything apart that has any great value. And I'll keep on going online. And then in, for the jewels for the bearings uh, question, are they porous so they can retain the oil or is it another? Yeah. That's a good question. It's a, no, they're not. Uh, um, they've got good surface tension. And uh, um, with uh, the previously and even currently, uh, you can still have bearings either in brass or in Cooper Brilliant. And um, you tend to have um, the lubricant migrating from from the spot where you want to keep it. But with, um, with jewel material, um, both by uh, the shape of the jewel, because it's got a, a countersink to retain uh, oil, but uh, all around you've got a, a fairly strong meniscus that is retaining the, the oil in place. So yeah, no, it's, it's, it's as unporous as, as possible. I've got one here with the end. Um, lots of these uh, start with excellent presentation, by the way. <laughs> I'm skipping them all for value. Uh, what accuracy would you be able to achieve in the watches that you make in the first and second per day? Um, I try and get the time, I get the timekeeping between. Uh, okay, I should explain that uh, watches are affected by gravity. The timekeeping is affected by gravity. So in each position, particularly the vertical positions, um, you get a different rate of time. And uh, uh, a lot of what we do is to try and get those times as tight or as close together as possible. Um, if you get a under 10 second variation is considered to be ex good, acceptable. Uh, but uh, you would then set the average time so it would it would be between zero and five second gain a day and um, you don't know how the watch is going to be worn what temperatures it's going to be exposed to or anything like that but uh, if it's outside the zero to five seconds a day you know justifiably our clients might like to get it closer than that Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier on, I've got two questions for you. You mentioned earlier on the use of complementary metals to combat thermal expansion issues. Yes. And um, is that still a technique used today or is it solved through other material science? I, and mm -hmm. for your um, hand machined parts that have maybe like critical dimensions for functionality, um, do you have some sort of like dimension verification process that you do and tools you use for that? And um, yeah, just what does that look like? I'd be used to it in an automated metrology department, but by hand, how you do it, I can't actually picture how you do it with something so small and fine. Yeah, um, first of all, with the, um, the metals, uh, we don't use uh, thermal compensation very often anymore. It's very, very rare. Um, you had, a, I think he's a metallurgist called Guillaume. 
at the turn of the 20th century, he came up with the, these ver ultra stable materials, uh, LNVAR and uh, INVAR. And uh, they, one was for the, the spring material and the other was for the balance. And um, they were extremely thermally stable. And in fact, it was the only uh, uh, Nobel Prize ever won in watchmaking. Uh, so does metallurgy, it's not a watchmaker who won it. Um, but, um, uh, and so, yeah, the stability of materials has increased to the point that we don't use thermal compensated materials anymore. Often, there are some people who still do, and some of them using very, very exotic materials. Um, the other thing is, uh, I mentioned uh, silicon and silicium, and uh, they, they are affected by temperature, but they use uh, plated surfaces to deplate these with other materials to actually make them thermally stable. And uh, uh, that, in addition to the anti-magnetic properties of uh, silicium, uh, means that you get really unheard of uh, um, precision for, for a watch. Um, as to the other question, um, what we would generally do, like if we're, uh, it's yeah, it's very, very important. You, you, you design a theoretically perfect component. And, uh, but when you're machining it, uh, you, you're never going to achieve that perfection. You always have to work within acceptable tolerances. And uh, we would use, uh, I don't have a photograph of it here, but uh, a back, you would put the component on a, on a lit surface. It would be backlit generally and it, that's magnified and projected onto a glass table and you would put a drawing on that uh, it's a retro projector and so you can line holes up you can line teeth up you can have the profile of a spring uh, or lever and you can see with great precision what the uh how close you are or uh to to the precision yeah exactly and and now with CAD, this is another innovation with cad uh you have uh uh, um, tools, very sophisticated laser and optical tools that uh, it, it's amazing to watch. You put a tray of parts underneath this and it will go around and measure the significant parts and compare it against the CAD drawing. So it's it's getting easier and easier in some respects. Now, I don't have that, but like, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, great questions. Let's take one more one from online and um, this is asking in the absence of the Irish uh, Horological Institute at close, what would you say is the best route for an aspiring watchman in Ireland? There are two uh, very good uh, schools in, in the UK. There's one in Manchester and one in Birmingham. And I've directed some uh, some people who are interested to go there. So there are a few Irish who have gone through those. Um, there's a uh, an organization called Wostep. It was a, a, a it's a, a watchmaking school in Switzerland. I went to it, and uh, um, it was geared towards non-Swiss watchmakers. And uh, they have set up a, um, a network of watchmaking schools around the world, and uh, just not here, unfortunately, not yet. Uh, but uh, that could be one route if we ever did get watchmaking up and running again to engage with one of the organizations such as WOSTEP to try and use their template of education to reestablish a watchmaking school. But that's no good for someone who's making that inquiry. Uh, Manchester or Birmingham, I'd recommend, or contact WOSTEP in Switzerland. Do you have one final question? Anybody? I was just meaning to ask you, um, at what age did you um, find out that you want this is exactly what you want to do, make watches? Um, very good question. It's great to see uh, yourselves there. Like you're obviously still in school and you're thinking about what you want to do. Um, I was, I suppose, about 17 when I, uh, when the idea was suggested to me. My father, uh, 
he repaired clocks and he it, it, he did it on the side. He, he was a compositor. He worked with a typesetter in, in the newspapers. And uh, uh, so it wasn't his profession. It was just something he did on the side. Uh, so we always had clocks in the house. And uh, uh, it might say, well, why did it take you so long to discover you wanted to become a watchmaker if I just grew up with clocks? But um, I was mechanic interested in mechanics, and I just didn't see this applying to me. My father suggested it, and once the thought got into my head, I was like, "Yeah, that sounds good." And um, I'm almost from day one. Once I started in the college, I was like, "Okay, I love this. This is this is for me." Uh, uh, so you knew you wanted to do it when you went into college. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and uh, actually, the funny thing is. My father didn't want me to become a watchmaker. Uh, <laughs> he said, listen, go to that college and you can get a really good job in Erlingus as an instrumentation technician because he understood straight away that these skills were transferable. And, uh, um, and uh, so when I came back and said, oh, this is fantastic. I think I know what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to be a watchmaker. He's like, that's a terrible idea. You know, in the 1980s, you only had quartz watches. Uh, and I wanted to work on mechanical watches. It looked like a complete dead end. Uh, but uh, I don't think anyone could have foreseen how the watchmaking industry transformed. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. <coughs> Watch, that's all we have time for this evening. Um, I take it you minutes just to obviously thank John for an outstanding presentation this evening. So please, everybody, keep your hands up. <laughs>